Okay, the new. We are not in the Yorkshire Lancashire border. Uh, far from that, in fact. We're on the Isle of Mull in Scotland. Uh, look at that. Epic, epic scenery. Um, so, we have been fortuitously called up by an old school friend of mine who's now running this 5,000 acre estate. Um, he came up for a bit of an holiday in the summer and he mentioned about the tree work. So, uh, there's 5,000 acres of trees. Um, but what we're focusing on at the minute is this, this area of like, I don't know, 100 acres or something just around the properties. Uh, so these are Victorian, um, Victorian built uh, manor house. And he's off, buildings going off around. So all we're doing is going around, making sure that nothing falls on property, falls on the road. Um, this is where six miles from the nearest road here. So if there is a blockage, it's only up to Sam, the estate manager, to clear the trees, but there's some big beefy trees here, so we're going to try and help him out a little bit, make sure there's no issues in the future. Uh, so the main tree that we're working on today is this, uh, this beautiful um, oh, uh, sycamore, sycamore miles away. So, um, so what's happened with this particular tree? Ooh. That, obviously that's no good, is it? If you've got a big meaty tree and you've got the heartwood that's just rotten out. So all that's holding this tree up is the sapwood. Um, but what I think has happened with this tree is there's another couple of trees with the damaged heartwood. So I think that there's like a honey fungus in the ground. And it, this tree's, um, well, the gardener, uh, he's buried in the churchyard I think he died 160 years since. So what I can presume is um, the uh, the estate was built and then the gardeners come in, landscaped it all, capability brown style. Um, he's passed on and he's left his legacy of trees, but for 160 years, um, a sycamore tree's coming to the end of its life. Um, and then it's, it's, uh, it's natural inbuilt immunity it's compromised as it gets older, so then the honey fungus in the ground gets into the tree, uh, and then honey funguses, they tend to uh, rot the heartwood out first. So this tree will probably have like about another 20 years left in it, but we don't want any gales like uh, sea, sea gusts blowing in onshore, knocking this down, knocking this Victorian fencing down, and blocking the road. Um, so we're gonna take this out today, but, uh, like I say, with this cast iron fencing underneath, probably as old as a tree, so we don't really want to be damaging that. So what we're going to do, we'll just have a come up here. So when you look, when you look back at the tree, you can just see uh, how big it is, and at some point you can see the middle leader has snapped out. That could be potentially due to the infection. Um, and, but it seems like it's happened a long time since. Because all the regen has filled in the space that the centre of the trees um, provided. So, what we're going to do is we're going to climb up, I'll put my anchor point in, and then we're going to use the lowering line um, to take everything off this left hand side of the tree. We'll lower it down on the ropes just so we're not damaging this, this bonnie fence. Um, and the rest of it, because we've got quite a big area to, to work in, the rest of it can just be felled out steadily away. Um, we've no chipper on this job. Um, you know, we've got some wild forest up here, so chipper uh, will just add to the cost of the project. So all we're going to do is we're going to cut all timber up into like four foot lengths. That could be logged up for the holiday cottages. Then the brash can be left in a pile and then just burn. Uh, yeah, so we shall bob back and we shall see uh, some lowering action and bits and bats.
to at Carseg. We've got our bellies full of Scotch porridge. Um, and we're going to crack on now. Well, we've already cracked on. Um, we've done about an hour's work just tidying up. So yesterday you saw how we felled out the, the right hand side of the tree. Um, so when, when I felled it out, I saw it as soon as it hit the ground, it just uh, disintegrated. So that's a sign that these, uh, the disease has got into the tree. It's compromised um, the structure of the tree. So that's been tied up. There's a pile of logs here. Um, looks like there's about eight fires in that big house. So I hope someone's got a sharp axe. So because the, uh, the heart of the tree is compromised, we can't fell it out in any direction without it going wherever. Um, so we've had to chog it down in big chunks and that gets caught up. Um, so this one's just about to pop. So when this comes out, we should see the extent of the rot that's coming up. And then we can see whether my decision to chog it down was right or not. So I reckon if we just maneuver this. Back. There it goes. There, all that punky wood there, I can put my hand into that. So I guess we're right in deciding to chog it down instead of felling it. Um, the rot, and then if we have a look at this here. In fact, I think this one, yeah. So that was the, um, if you remember when we started, oh, actually I've made an error. Um, so I think I, I lied to you at the start and said this was a sycamore. Um, Acer pseudoplatanus, but I was wrong, it's a horse chestnut, Aeschylus hippocastinum. And you tend to find that with horse chestnuts, once they get to maturity, they do succumb to um, disease. Canker is quite a, uh, like a, popular is the wrong word, but they, they do succumb to bacterial infections. This isn't canker because with canker you get like a foul smell. Um, but this particular limb here, was the centre one, if you can remember when we first started on the tree. That was the one that snapped out here since. So because it was all torn, the tree's tried to heal itself, just like we do on cuts. Um, but because it was such a substantial limb, uh, the disease is ingressed. Uh, initially I thought it might be a fungal infection in the ground. Um, I think that the rot has extended down through this point of ingress where the, the um, that main limb stacked out. So unfortunately that, that signed the death knell for this uh, horse chestnut. No more conkers, but there will be some uh, warmth in the, uh, the holiday cottages and the big house. So we're just gonna carry on chogging this down and then we'll probably come back at the end and just see how far that, that rock's extending into the heartwood. Hour later and we've managed to get it down to the ground. You can just see the extent now of the, uh, the rock that was in this horse chestnut. So, as we've gone down to the ground, um, you know, that would have been joined up to there. And there was a quite a big tear in this side of the tree. Um, let's see if we can a big tear, so there could be like a, a multitude of factors that have caused the demise of this tree. The rot, um, that big tear, um, and it's just, uh, just been too much for this tree's uh, vitality and integrity, and then it's succumb to uh, subsequent infection then. You can tell that by the rock that's setting in on this side of the tree. This side of the tree appeared to be quite healthy, but um, there we've got infection going in. So this tree was pretty much buggered really. Uh, I dare say we could have probably felled it, but when you, if it's the first tree on a new job, you don't really want to be smashing anything up the earth spore. So. so this is down, plenty of logs for the uh, for the estate managers to be sharpening these axe and splitting. Uh, so we're on to the next tree now, which is um, this uh, fairly small one here. Um, that we'll jump over the fence and we'll have a closer look at it. Right, so this is the next tree. Um, quite tricky to tell with all leaf, uh, that leaves are falling. Um, we've we'll had a look at the buds and it's a sycamore. Uh, Acer pseudoplatanus. So the way, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with this tree, but I think 
just the space that it's grown into with this leaning horse chestnut and the big mature limes at the back it's just uh, grown out on a that precarious angle um if it was in the woods uh you'd leave it as a bonny tree but i guess because this is the, this is the main route into the estate and the estate manager wants this taken out so we can't fell it because it'll flatten the fence so we're going to go up and we're going to strip the canopy uh take about half the canopy off and then we'll fell it down into them rhododendrons so right, i'll get the climbing kit on monkeying around on mo we're, um, so we've sided this tree up now, ready for felling. Um, but I bet some folk who are watching might be just wondering how on earth do those, those idiots get up them trees? So there's, there's various ways and techniques and uh, bits of equipment, but it's basically all the same. Um, so to get up the tree, have got these squirrel spikes on, these like some two inch spikes there, and they're fastened to my boots, and they're proper arborist boots, so they're stiff soled, so I'm not, my feet aren't flexing over that big metal uh, plate on the bottom then there's like a velcro strap around your calves so I can like be gripping anything here so then as we're going up the uh, the tree on this one we've got like a positioning strap a flip line so in here these like it's a steel core and that has some rope around it for the steels in case I catch it with my saw I'm not gonna be falling out the tree so that's fastened onto my harness uh, with these safety, a better one. These safety carabiners, so they've got a three-way action to open them. So I can't open it accidentally when up the tree, and then whatever it's attached to will end up coming off them. So we've got the three-way carabiner, and the flip line, and then we've got a rope grab there. So uh, the rope will pull through, so I can tighten it. But when I pull the other way, there's like a, there's a lock there, so I can't pull it back. So I can lean back into the tree. So if I'm, uh, if I want to position myself, I just flip that round, let some line out, flip it onto my harness, and then I'm fast there, and I can do whatever I want with the saw. And I'm not going to like you're not relying on your balance and your shaky legs. So that's off. Then we'll come down to your level. There we are. So, so I've got my climbing line. So when I get up to the very top of the tree, what I'll do then is I'll put one of these pulleys on. Uh, take that off here. So what this does is my climbing line. Those cheeks come apart and then I can put the line in there. Then this little, uh, this little, um, I forget what they're called then, prussic goes through there. And then that can go around my, um, so up at the top of the tree, I'll find I'll find a branch that's maybe as thick as your arm, thick as your wrist. That goes around. Back onto the carabiner, lock that. And then that goes, oh, spins down. So that goes down to the prussic here. So that prussic will allow me to go up and down the rope. But when my weight goes in it, see how it kinks that rope there? So that grabs it, so I, I, I'm not going to be sliding up and down the rope. Okay, it's a lot safer. And plus, one of the benefits of having the pulley on is I can shunt myself up the rope like that. So it's a lot easier. Uh, you can see how it works there. So I've got another three-way carabiner. So that goes through the pulley, back onto there. So that prussic there, so let's tangle up. 
This is just a double bind on the rope so that can slide up and down. But then when I put weight on it, see how it kinks. Uh, so that's how we get up and down trees. There's various ways of uh, doing it, like I say. There's mechanical aids. I think the, uh, I forget what they're called. They have some like, fancy names for them, but there's some of them. These mechanical climbing aids, like 150 quid. That plus it cost me 11 quid. So I can, I can buy, enough, buy 10 of them. There's like, five, six years of climbing there for the cost of um, £11 each. Whereas if I were to get like one of these Petzl, um, I forget what they're called, zigzags, 150 quid. I'll about look smart, um, but I've spent a lot of money. And like I say, we're from the Yorkshire area, so we don't like spending money. So anyway, I'm wittering. So we've taken the top out of this tree. So we're going to fill it down now. Probably in line with where the rhododendrons are. Um, and this brush that we put here is going to make sure that nothing's going to roll down into the fence. So I'll unclip all these gubbins. Take that off. Um, and then, yes, so we shall fell the tree. So you join us again, we're just about to knock this tree over. So it's a hell of a lean on it, that. Uh, and as I put my gob cut in, and a nasty little surprise of a hole in the tree. Um, so, um, with leaning trees, if I was to cut, just do a straight back cut on that, it could snap out and launch me back to over, over the uh, over the sound of mud to, up to Auburn. I don't want that. So this a cut called a dog tooth cut we can do, which takes the, the uh, The words escape me. Um, text the text the text the heartwood out the tree, and then so I'll put a back cut in, and maybe leave about a third of the the holding wood on the back. So then when I'm ready, I just put a, a diagonal cut into that, and it just pops over nice and quietly. Um, but I've never, to be honest with you, I've never done one on such a leaning tree that's hollow before. So we'll. You might be in for a, a comedy moment. We shall see what happens. It's another one as well. So when I've put the gob in, I've opened that up. Uh, I'll just grab this. So I've opened it up quite a lot. So normally, I put my gob on like a 45 degree angle but this one I've opened it up a lot more because when you have an open gob uh, the tree will stay on the hinge until it hits the floor if I was to put like a, sh a shallow gob in there as soon as that point closes up it'll pop off the hinge and it can go anywhere then so I put the big open face gob on it so hopefully it'll stay on the hinge and hit the floor
my plunge cut on both sides now. And I left a nice, good, healthy hinge so that nothing untoward happens. Uh, so when I put my back cut in, my diagonal cut, I always make sure I'm on the top side of the tree. Because obviously, if I'm on the bottom, you get squashed. So we'll do the back cut, we'll see if it comes over all right. Oh! And just to be sure, when I found the, uh, the rot in the tree, I've tied a line to this big cypress here. So it shouldn't, hopefully, it won't be going through the fence. We'll see. Blacksmith was checking in his grave then. So let's have a look. There we are. So that's the hole going down into there. So as I've come through with my plunge cut, I've gone into my gob there. So that's a no noise, that. that's a fail. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if I'd have just come across with the, the plunge cut there, whether that would have gone more in line with the roadies instead of like just tipping off to the bit but it's only like five yards five yards away from where i wanted it so the plunge cut from both sides and then when i've come in with the diagonal cut you always get that this little bit of holding wood here tearing so as, I, as the tree went it was like and you can hear it tearing this back bit out uh but yeah i'm not gonna lie i was twitching a little bit when i saw it roll down going towards the fence but it's safe, so we've got about half an hour now before it's pitch dark here. And there's some traffic waiting for us, so woo! So we better get uh, better get them source fired up again. So we're back on Mull still. Um, the next tree, so we've got a horse chestnut here, and it looks like uh, this tree here has uh, blown over in the past. And it's completely demolished after this tree's taken taken half of the canopy out, which leaves the tree unbalanced mean that he wants to go that well that way really onto the road um, so the landlord wants to take it out uh, it's gonna be quite a tricky fell is this because you can have a look you see these here so they're called widow makers in the trade um, when it's come down whoever's whoever's like snedded the tree up and um, should have cleared them down because it's really dangerous is that uh, luckily they're wedged in so I don't think that when it comes down these are going to fall down on where I am um, but these are incredibly dangerous trees to take out with these ideally I climb up and strip it out but I, I don't want to be climbing up past that so because we're leaning that way with the unbalanced canopy we're going to go for a dog tooth cut again so you can see where I put my gob in it's like a nice big open um, mouth on it so hopefully it'll stay on the hinge and um, wait till it reaches the floor. Uh, we put some, we put two lines on just to stop it from rolling down onto the road and through the railings. And we're hoping that when the canopies fall into those rhododendrons, they'll get all tangled up and it'll stay put. So we shall see what happens. Um, yeah, that's it. So I'm gonna do my dog tooth cut and hopefully if you, if you so when I come in, not with a back cut but when I put do the bore cut on the the dog tooth say if that's my hinge on the front the back of my gob I'll leave a big wedge on this side because there's some holding wood then that'll that hopefully will swing the tree round into the rhododendrons but nothing's uh, nothing's guaranteed so we shall see what happens Absolutely 
perfect. Oh. So we'll just have a look at this uh, the thing. Not many jobs where it gives you that much satisfaction. Right, so as I came in and bored through, I've got my wedge there. So there was plenty of holding wood there. And luckily the bar just popped through. So I brought it round a bit, then come in with the dog tooth. And that released all this tension up the back. So if I was to come in with a back cut there, chances are it'd bust out, cause like problems would have flattened the fence. Um, they're under a hell of a hell of a lot of tension, so I dare say if we hadn't tied it up, it'd have rolled down. So right, so it's like one o'clock now. So we've got about two hours to get this cleared up before it's pitch dark. Great, I've all cleared so right, 